It all started with a routine errand, an innocent sprinkle of baby powder, and a dash to the store. Little did I know that a Karen cop will arrest me for my baby's powder. Thinking it's drugs, here's how it all went down. I never thought that a routine errand after giving my daughter her evening bath would land me in the back of a police car. I'm a full-time dad. After my wife and I decided that I'd be the one to stay at home, every day has been a balance of play dates, story times, and yes, lots of baby powder. On that particular day, I had just finished bathing my little girl, topped her off with some powder for that fresh baby smell, and realized I had to run out to grab some essentials before the stores closed. I popped next door, asked my neighbor to listen out for my daughter. She was already a fan of her giggles, and promised I'd be back before they even knew it. I rushed out, still wearing the remnants of the baby powder on my shirt. It's like the new dad uniform, right? Who even cares about a bit of powder? Anyway, I'm halfway to the store when I see the lights in my mirror. Great, I thought. Probably a taillight out or something. I wasn't speeding, or so I thought, so this should have been a five-minute delay. Tops. Enter Officer Karen. I swear her haircut had its own authority, and I do the usual. Good evening, officer. She asks for my license, then asks if I knew I was driving a little fast. Sorry, officer, I'm in a bit of a hurry. My neighbor's watching my daughter, and I need to grab some stuff for the house. Karen officer is looking at me, then at my shirt, and his brow furrows. What's that on your shirt? She asks. I look down, and there's a streak of baby powder right there. Oh, that's just baby powder. I was giving my daughter a bath. You'd think I just told her it was fairy dust by the way she reacted. She didn't buy it. She asked me to step out of the car, and I'm starting to get nervous, but still kind of in disbelief, like this has to be a joke, right? Next thing I know, she's patting me down, and then come the handcuffs. I tried to stay calm, explain it's a misunderstanding, but it seems once the handcuffs are on, it's like you're already guilty of something. I'm sitting in the back of her car, thinking about my daughter next door, probably wondering why her bedtime story is late. Karen is on her radio, and it's dawning on me that this is really happening. I'm getting taken to the station for what? Baby powder? It's absurd. At the station, they're all business. They take my stuff, take my picture, and I get put in a holding cell while they test the powder. The only thing going through my mind is my daughter. She's probably wondering where I am, and I just hope my neighbor is keeping her calm. After what feels like forever, some other officer comes in and tells me the powder tested as surprise baby powder. He says I can go, and there's this half-hearted apology like they're doing me a favor by letting me go after they made the mistake. I'm out of there as fast as they'll let me, rushing back home. When I get there, my neighbor's relieved, and my daughter's asleep on the couch, clutching her favorite teddy bear. My neighbor says she was asking for me, but she managed to get her to sleep. I can't thank her enough. I'm just glad my daughter's too young to understand any of this. This whole thing was so out of left field. One second you're a dad doing dad things, the next, you're a suspect for who knows what because of baby powder. It's crazy. It's like, there's no normal anymore. I understand cops have to do their job, but it's like common sense took a back seat to this one. And what if I were a single dad? What if there was no neighbor to watch my daughter? The what ifs keep playing in my head. I've told a few of my friends about it, and we've had a laugh now that it's over and I can tell the story. But it's a nervous laugh, you know? Like, it's funny until it happens to you. I've learned a lesson, though. Next time, I'll check the mirror before I leave the house, and maybe take it a bit slower on those errands, no matter how close to closing time it is. In the end, all's well that ends well, I guess. My daughter woke up the next morning none the wiser, happy to see me, and ready for her cereal like any other day. And me? I've got a story that's sure to raise some eyebrows at the next playgroup meetup. The Great Baby Powder Incident, they'll call it. But hey, just another day in the life of a dad, I guess. Life is full of unexpected twists and turns, especially when you're raising a little one. But it's these moments, even the less pleasant ones, that remind you of what's really important. I hugged my daughter a little tighter that morning, grateful for the normalcy of our daily routine. This experience, though, it's going to stick with me. It's a reminder of how quickly things can go south over the simplest misunderstandings. Makes me think about all the other dads out there, rushing around, just trying to do their best. We're all just one weird incident away from a story we'll never forget, no matter how ordinary our lives might seem. And as for Officer Karen, after the first test confirmed it was baby powder, she insisted on testing it again, because surely no one would be that careless, right? There must be more to it, according to the law, according to Karen. When the second test also confirmed it was, indeed, just baby powder, she finally let me go with a lecture on proper storage of suspicious-looking substances. I mean, really? It's baby powder, not a bag of flour from a high-stakes baking show. And as for the neighborhood, well, it's got a bit of excitement to talk about now, and I've got a new level of respect for always having a backup plan. I'll be keeping an eye out and taking it easy, but also I can't help but wonder about the next routine thing that might just turn into an adventure, or a misadventure. I just hope it involves less police and more playtime. 
Can't believe someone would mistake baby powder for drugs, but I guess stranger things have happened. Glad everything turned out okay in the end. Stay safe, dads. As a former employee at a fast food joint, I never expected a routine shift to turn into a twisted tale of deception and greed. Little did I know, the encounter with an entitled mother would lead to a shocking series of events, all centered around her twisted attempt to profit from her child's burns. Here's how it all went down. A few years back, when I was working at a fast food joint, I had an encounter that stuck with me. It was a regular shift, and I was bringing dinner out to a table in the restaurant's garden. There, an older woman was enjoying the evening with her grandson, a little guy about four or five years old. I remember approaching the table, the grandmother smiling up at me as I set down their order. Here you go. Anything else I can get for you? I asked, making sure they were all set. No, thank you, dear, the grandmother replied warmly. As we chatted, the little boy, with the curiosity of his age, reached out for a cup on the table. Before I could even react, he had tipped it over, spilling hot water all over himself. His screams pierced the calm evening air, and my heart raced. Oh my goodness, I exclaimed, rushing inside to grab some towels, mistakenly thinking he had reached for his iced tea. When I returned, the scene had escalated. The child's mother had appeared, and she was frantically trying to strip the soaked clothes off her son, her eyes wild with panic and something else. Anger, maybe? What happened to my baby? She cried out as I handed her the towels. He grabbed the hot water by accident, I explained, my voice shaking. This is outrageous! I want compensation for this, she demanded, her focus shifting rapidly from her son's cries to the potential for a payout. I was taken aback by her reaction, but I knew I had to keep a level head. I'm so sorry. Let me get the manager and we'll call an ambulance right away, I said, trying to provide some reassurance. I darted back inside, found my manager, and quickly briefed her on the situation. We need an ambulance at the garden table, and the mother is asking about compensation, I said, trying to keep my composure. My manager, a seasoned pro, nodded and immediately took action. I'll take care of this. Let's make sure the child is our first priority, she said, dialing for medical assistance. As the ambulance whisked the child away to the hospital, the mother's true intentions became clear. She was on her phone, her voice a mix of frustration and opportunism. This is their fault, and we're going to make sure they pay for it, she said, already plotting her next move. It was a sobering moment for me. A child was hurt, and yet, there was this immediate leap to talk of lawsuits and compensation. It was a glimpse into a side of people that I hadn't seen before, one where concern is overshadowed by greed. It made me wonder about the world we live in, where a child's pain could be seen as a chance to profit. Witnessing her behavior, screaming for compensation while her child was in agony, I feared that she would falsely blame me for the incident. Fortunately, the only camera in the garden recorded the entire event in high definition, leaving no doubt that I was not at fault. The real issue was the lack of attention from the child's mother and grandmother. Unaware of the presence of security cameras, the mother decided to fabricate a false narrative. Initially, she claimed to the restaurant's manager that I had poured the water on her son and that she had witnessed it. However, it was evident that she was purchasing additional food at the time of the incident, and multiple witnesses could confirm that she was not in the garden. Realizing her first lie was futile, she changed her story and alleged that I had assured her that the water was cold. It was absurd to think that I would have informed her, someone not even at the table, that the cup labeled Caution Hot contained cold water. When confronted with the fact that I couldn't have made such a statement since she wasn't present, she concocted yet another version of events. This time, she claimed that the cup had no lid. However, the security camera footage clearly showed that the cup did have a lid. Furthermore, she insisted that she hadn't ordered any hot drinks, but the receipt proved that she was lying once again. The day after the incident, the restaurant was buzzing with the usual lunchtime crowd when the mother stormed in, her face twisted with anger. She was on a tirade, demanding to know why no one from our team had called the hospital to inquire about her son's condition. Can you believe no one even checked on my son? What kind of heartless people are you? She railed at the staff, her voice dripping with indignation. The main manager, a tall man with a calm demeanor, stepped forward. He had been briefed about yesterday's fiasco and was prepared for the confrontation. Ma'am, we are not authorized to receive personal medical information about your son. We did what we could by calling an ambulance, he explained, trying to reason with her. But she was having none of it. Because of you, my son has second-degree burns. You should be ashamed. You, she pointed at me, you should be fired for this. I'm going to the police and I'll see you in court. The manager maintained his composure. We understand you're upset, but we have all the evidence that shows we responded appropriately. 
Our staff will cooperate fully if there's an investigation, he said firmly. He then pulled us aside, warning that we might need to give statements at the police station. The woman's threats were escalating, and we had to be prepared for whatever came next. Later, we learned she had emailed the corporate office, spinning a tale of negligence and demanding justice. But the corporate lawyers were quick to respond, assuring us that we had nothing to fear. The evidence was on our side, and it was clear that her claims of us deliberately harming her child wouldn't stand up in any court. Despite the chaos she was trying to stir up, there was a sense of solidarity among the staff. We knew we had done our best in a bad situation, and no amount of her screaming or threatening could change that. I worked there only during holidays, so I stopped working there around a month after that and returned the next holiday and another one. It was two years after the incident when the manager told me that the mother recently had given up trying to get the compensation because every attempt was unsuccessful. The footage from the security cameras was enough to prove what happened, and none of the employees from that day were called to the police station nor court. The petty thing about the whole situation with this mother who was so sure that she will be able to get a lot of money with her lies, the main manager told me that they would willingly pay for the boy's treatment, but they decided not to after she said so many bad things about me and other employees who had any contact with her before and during the incident. So she was left with nothing but hatred and medical bills. I'm only sorry for the boy who had to suffer so much and his mother probably didn't even really care, especially that she wasn't able to make any profit off of it. You know, the saying, the customer is always right, doesn't always hold true. It's a good thing the manager believed the OP and didn't let the mother fool them. It's important to stand up for the truth and not let deceptive behavior go unchecked. As I stumbled upon my husband's secret Snapchat conversations with a female co-worker, innocent exchanges quickly turned into questionable interactions. With every lie and hidden conversation, the discomfort grew, forcing me to confront the reality of this inappropriate relationship. Here's how it all went down. My husband Snapchats with a female co-worker daily. He has sent a questionable TikTok to her, and she sent him a picture of herself in her pajamas. They are best friends on Snapchat. I expressed that their relationship makes me uncomfortable, and he responded by hiding it and lying about talking to her. A co-worker, whom we will refer to as Debbie, began working with my husband, whom we will call Charlie, two years ago. Last September, I met Debbie for the first time at a wedding attended by their co-workers. She sat behind us. It is worth noting that the bride, who is also a co-worker, does not like Charlie, but invited the entire shift to the wedding. In a casual conversation, the bride referred to Charlie as a snake when speaking to Debbie. Although they are not friends, I do not consider this a red flag as I believe Charlie is generally a good person. Debbie informed Charlie about this incident and it became an ongoing inside joke, which I was aware of. At the wedding, Charlie texted Debbie the word snake and she playfully mouthed stop. While I did interpret this as flirtatious, I considered it to be a reflection of her personality. Fast forward to last year's Christmas party for the shift. We had been hosting Christmas parties for the shift at our house for two years. The entire shift was present, but Debbie brought her twin sister as her plus one. One thing to note about their job is that it is a male-dominated field, but I am friends with a few of Charlie's co-workers' wives. During the party, all the women were hanging out together, except for Debbie and her twin sister. They were hanging out with the guys. I assumed it was because they didn't know most of the women. It wasn't a big deal, but the next day, Debbie sent Charlie a couple of photos that she had taken of him without his knowledge. The photos were accompanied by the text, Why did I take these? LOL. Charlie showed me this and his response, which was pretty innocent, but I did make a comment like, LOL, I think she has a crush on you. Charlie dismissed it. Fast forward to February. Charlie's co-workers, all in their 20s, convince him to get Snapchat. Personally, I have never been a fan of Snapchat, and Charlie has only used Reddit as his form of social media. However, after he gets Snapchat, I notice that he spends a lot more time on his phone. Admittedly, I can be nosy at times, and I recognize that as a flaw of mine. Nevertheless, I start noticing that he talks about Debbie more frequently, which leads me to question who he is chatting with. One thing I observe is that every time he works overtime, she snaps him to ask if he is working or if he worked it the next day. I express my discomfort to him, but he brushes it off. March. On a Wednesday night, we attend a dinner party at a new co-worker's house. None of the wives that I am friends with are present. I have to work on Thursday, while everyone else has the day off. Before heading to the party, we discuss leaving at a reasonable time. At 9.45 p.m., I ask my husband what time we are planning to leave. He hesitates, which frustrates me, and I walk off. This leads to him getting angry and deciding to stay as late as he wants. Throughout the night, I continue to ask when we are leaving and remind him of my work obligations. Eventually, I end up spending the rest of the evening crying on the couch in a stranger's house. Four people come to check on me, but Charlie and Debbie never do. I notice them sitting together outside. We eventually leave the party around 1.30 a.m. In May, we decided to spice up our weekend by heading to a hot air balloon festival about an hour away from our home. 
It was a perfect day. The sky dotted with colorful balloons, and I was soaking in the joy of it all. That was until I noticed Charlie, my partner, glued to his phone with a half-smile dancing on his lips. Who are you texting? I asked, a twinge of curiosity in my voice. Oh, it's Debbie, he replied nonchalantly. She's about 30 minutes away from here. I told her to swing by and join us. I felt a knot form in my stomach. You invited Debbie without asking me first, I said, trying to keep my voice even. Charlie seemed puzzled by my reaction. I didn't think it would be a big deal. She's just a friend, he said. But it was a big deal to me. And before I knew it, we were in the middle of a heated argument. The joy of the day evaporated, and we ended up leaving the festival in a huff, long before Debbie could arrive. Later, Charlie informed me that their conversation had been purely about meeting up, but the damage was done. Fast forward to June, we took a trip to London, a city that always held a special place in our hearts. We returned to the States on our anniversary, and I put together a super cute slideshow to commemorate the occasion. It was a hit, and as the likes and comments poured in, I felt a warm glow of happiness. That glow dimmed when Debbie popped up again, this time on Charlie's Snapchat. She messaged him about someone breaking into her car. Charlie read the message and immediately expressed his concern. That's terrible, he said, shaking his head. Debbie's car got broken into. I frowned, finding the timing more than just a coincidence. On our anniversary, I mused aloud. That's odd. Charlie looked at me, his forehead creasing with worry. Bad things don't have a schedule, he said. I nodded, but inside I couldn't shake the feeling that Debbie's reach out was a little too convenient, a little too intrusive. It was as if she had a sixth sense for moments when she could slide back into our lives, uninvited, yet impossible to ignore. August rolled around with the summer heat, and things between Charlie and me had been off. He assured me he'd cut ties with Debbie because it was causing tension between us. But there was this nagging feeling in the pit of my stomach, a whisper telling me that not all was as it seemed. Charlie had been more distant lately, and it wasn't just the physical space, it was in the way he spoke, the way he avoided eye contact. He got a new phone in July, but for some reason he kept his old one. One day, when my intrusive thoughts got the better of me, I found myself rummaging through his old phone. There it was, clear as day. A 45-minute call logged with Debbie while I was at work, and they were both off. Driven by a mix of betrayal and desperation, I logged into Charlie's TikTok account. My heart sank as I saw he'd sent her a video from Barstool Sports, a girl confessing a crush and the guy reacting positively. It felt like a punch to the gut, but it didn't stop there. Two days before he sent that video, Debbie reposted one that said, When you're trying to go to sleep but all you can think about is wanting him in your bed. And two days after the crush video, she reposted another saying, The most confusing place you can be is knowing you have a connection with someone, but you're not officially together but you're more than friends. I couldn't breathe. The evidence was right there, in likes and reposts and late night conversations. I confronted Charlie, my voice trembling but firm. This, whatever this is with Debbie, it's not appropriate. It's not just friendship. He looked at me, his face a mask of innocence. I haven't talked to her about any of this, he claimed, even as I watched Debbie's videos disappear from her account like ghosts being banished at dawn. But you did send her that video, I pressed on, and she's been posting things that are clearly about you, about wanting you. Charlie shook his head, a practiced look of confusion on his face. We stopped talking, I swear. I don't know why she deleted her videos, but it wasn't because of me. I wanted to believe him, I really did. But trust, once cracked, isn't easily mended. And as I stood there, looking into the eyes of the man I loved, I couldn't help but wonder if the distance between us had been his way of slowly, silently choosing her over me. Last week, I decided to check his Snapchat on his old phone because I still had a gut feeling they talked every single day. While I was looking, she sent him a picture of herself in her pajamas, saying, Now I'm in my PJs LOL? It wasn't inappropriate, but I have never sent a selfie of myself to any of my male friends, let alone in my pajamas. I expressed my discomfort with their friendship and asked him to end it. It's important to note that we are also in couples therapy. During an argument, he told me that he likes having friends. I have no issue with any of his other friends. I asked him why he lied and said he stopped talking to her. He admitted it was because he knew I didn't approve. I now feel like I can't trust him anymore. And he essentially told me that he would rather be friends with her than be married to me. I sought advice from all my friends and they all told me to leave him. We have been married for 13 years and together for a total of 15 years. So, against my better judgment, I gave him an ultimatum. He went to see a lawyer friend two days later, but ultimately decided it wasn't the right path for him. Our therapist convinced him to block the coworker, and we were working on our marriage. I genuinely believed we were making progress. We were starting to have more productive conversations about our issues without them turning into heated arguments. He was actually opening up in therapy, but then his avoidant attachment style was triggered. He went to Debbie's birthday dinner, and I chose not to go. He stayed at his parents' house and came home the next day. 
I received a Snapchat request from a new female friend and noticed that Debbie had a top friend in common with me on my list. I don't really use Snapchat except to send videos to a female friend who has an iPhone while I have an Android. So I have two best friends on Snapchat, Carrie and Charlie. Debbie has the sunglasses emoji next to her name on my list, which can only mean that Charlie added her back. I asked him to pack a bag and leave. I will be contacting a lawyer as soon as possible on Monday. It's the most difficult decision I've ever made. I'm sorry to hear about your situation, OP. It must be challenging for you. It's commendable that you stood up for yourself and prioritized your well-being. I'm curious to understand the reasons behind your husband's decision to attend the party, even though he knew it would upset you. Additionally, his choice to stay at his parents' house afterwards may raise some concerns. How did he react when you asked him to leave? Take care of yourself during this difficult time. Stay strong. Growing up, my sisters and I eagerly awaited the promises of lavish trips from our uncle, only to be let down time and time again. Now, as a parent, I couldn't bear to see my daughter experience the same disappointment. So, I finally confronted my uncle, hoping to put an end to this cycle. Here's how it all went down. So here's a little backstory. When my sisters and I were kids, our uncle would give us cards for our birthdays and Christmas. Inside those cards, he would include a printed picture of a place we would love to go, like local theme parks, the zoo, aquarium, museums, etc. He would then tell us that we were going to visit that place, saying things like, It's going to be the best trip of your life! Obviously, this made us very excited. However, we never actually went on any of those trips or visited any of those places. As young kids, it was disappointing, but over time, we started expecting it and just went along with it. I don't hold any animosity towards him because I now understand that he did it because he couldn't afford to buy us gifts. However, I'm starting to have an issue with it now. Last week, for my daughter's fifth birthday, my uncle gave her a card with a printed picture of a theme park located about two hours away from our house. He promised her a fun weekend away, including things like a giant hotel room with a swimming pool, unlimited snacks, and tickets to all the shows she wanted to see at the park. My daughter was over the moon. She has been talking non-stop about this trip for the past week, telling me how excited she is and how excited her whole class at school is for her. It breaks my heart to see her so happy, knowing that it's not going to happen. I remember how disappointing it was for me, and I don't want her to experience that. So, I decided to text my uncle. Here's what the message said. Hi, the message in daughter's name card was so beautiful. Do you think next time you could leave out the promise of an extravagant trip? The thought and gesture are amazing. However, I never know what to say when she asks me when this trip will be. She absolutely loves spending time with you, so I know that the promise of even a nice lunch together would make her so happy. He never responded, but my aunt told me that he was upset. She mentioned that he was offended because he felt I implied that he could only afford a nice lunch. I didn't mean it in that way at all. I just wanted him to understand that my daughter loves him and wants to spend time with him, and he doesn't need to promise impossible things to make that happen. However, I can see why he interpreted it that way, and now I'm wondering if I'm the jerk here. This has been an unspoken issue in my family for so many years, so now I'm questioning whether I should have just kept it that way. I simply can't bear the thought of my little girl getting disappointed so many times. My sisters and my mom agree with me, and my mom even said she wished she had put a stop to it when we were kids. So, am I the jerk for telling my uncle to stop gifting my daughter extravagant trips? A lot of people have asked me why I was being so nice to my uncle, and honestly, I underestimated how unusual it was because it's been normalized in my family. I didn't want to cause drama, so I approached it in a non-confrontational manner. Now I realize I should have been more direct. Another concern many of you had was that I allowed this to happen to my daughter before. That is not true. This is the first time he promised her one of his trips. That's why I decided to speak up so this doesn't become a recurring situation. Here's the update. I tried to call my uncle twice, but he didn't answer. I managed to talk to my aunt and explained everything to her, how many times he did this to my siblings and me, and how often we were disappointed. I told her that my daughter was so excited, and if they were actually planning to take her on this trip, I would apologize. She didn't react well. She told me I was creating unnecessary drama and that my daughter and I were acting entitled to expect them to drop everything for this trip. I was shocked and angry. I said, how dare you say that? My daughter didn't imagine this trip in her mind and then expect you to take her. You promised her this trip. Her disappointment is not entitlement. I told her it's not my responsibility to ensure a grown man feels secure in himself, and it's a shame my family spent so long coddling him. I was so mad that I just hung up. I no longer feel any guilt for setting my boundary. For everyone asking if I can take my daughter on the trip, unfortunately, that theme park closes for the season this month. But I surprised her with something even better. After the phone call with my aunt, my partner and I decided to book a trip to Disneyland. It may sound crazy and impulsive, but we've been wanting to plan this for a while now and decided it's the perfect time. My kid deserves an extravagant trip. 
Last night, we sat her down and explained that her uncle won't be able to take her on the trip. I tried to be as honest as possible without confusing her. She was understandably upset and had many questions. After answering them all, I assured her not to worry because her mom and dad are taking her somewhere instead. When she found out it was Disney, she was over the moon. She spent all day deciding which Minnie Mouse stuffed animal she wants to bring with her. I told her to tell her class that her trip got upgraded. All things considered, it's a happy ending. I know I won't always be able to shield her from disappointment, but I will do my best. She's getting that giant hotel room she was promised. It is absolutely okay to be protective of your daughter. As a parent, it's natural to want to shield our children from disappointment and ensure their happiness. You made a thoughtful decision to address the situation and prioritize your daughter's emotional well-being. Nothing to be bothered about. Keep being an amazing parent. If you enjoyed today's stories, check out the other videos on your screen now. Submit your own stories at you'rethejerk.com. Subscribe now or you're definitely the jerk.